So my topic today is individual plant treatments to control woody invasive species. Uh, we deal with a lot of different uh, woody invaders here in the state, and I thought it would be useful to kind of go over your options um, to treat when you're treating one plant at a time. What are some of the things you can do? What are the, the relative benefits and the, and the issues with each of these? And so for today, we're going to start with a little bit about woody plant biology and why they're a little different than some of the other invaders that we deal with get into some of the basic principles of individual plant treatments, uh, the techniques for IPT or individual plant treatment, and then at the end, uh, give some resources to, to learn more about this topic. So woody invasive plants uh, kind of encompass a lot of different growth forms, anywhere from you know full-size large trees like Tree of Heaven or, or Polonia uh, or um, Russian olive, uh, to shrubs like our honeysuckles and buckthorns and, and things like that, as well as woody vines like bittersweet here. Uh, often woody invasive plants are one of the primary invaders in our natural systems, whether that is open lands, um, or like here where we see bush honeysuckle and autumn olive, or forested situations where uh, this poor spot here has bittersweet honeysuckle and autumn olive all mixed in together. And so these can be very, very damaging, right, to the ecosystems. We've seen um, sites like this where very severe infestations where uh, very little uh, other native plants can, can make it in there, uh, very difficult to control, or just very dense thickets of smaller uh, ones as well. But most of the ecosystems we have in Illinois, the terrestrial ecosystems anyway, um, may have some of these woody invasive species, right? Whether they're park settings or forest settings or prairies, um, there's a lot of different um, invaders out there and a lot of reasons to control these. And so that's really why we're focusing on this would be just they're such a major invader and controlling them is, uh, is a major part of, of natural resource protection and management. So just a little bit about woody invasive plant biology. So these are perennial plants. They're typically fairly long lived. Uh, most of these woody invasive plants will sprout aggressively following damage. Um, so they don't, so cutting them down or just simply mechanically damage, damage them is usually not sufficient uh, as a method of control. They'll sprout aggressively. Most tend to sprout um, just from the root collar, but there are some that are clonal uh, that can actually root sucker as well. And we'll talk about that at the end, but that does provide additional challenges to management. Most of these, but definitely not all of them, tend to have somewhat short-lived seed banks under five years uh, with a few exceptions. And then birds and then wind are the two uh, most common dispersal agents when we're looking at um, these woody invasive plants. Almost all of these were introduced intentionally, some for agriculture, some for ornamental, but most of these were, um, were intentional introductions in the past, um, not realizing the, the problems that they would create. And almost all of these are promoted uh, strongly by disturbance to an ecosystem. So you're going to find these on forest edges, um, any places where there's uh, extra light or um, extra bare soil in the ecosystem, it, they tend to get a hold there. And so again, you can see uh, some of the intentional introduction um, of these. So there's multiflora rose back in the 50s that was planted for living fences and wildlife cover and autumn olive for wildlife and other conservation uses, right? So we did introduce a lot of these. And this is just a picture highlighting um, it's kind of that that disperse that that tie into disturbance, right? So this is a an aerial photo following a huge wind event a few years ago in southern Illinois. This um, We were looking to see all the trees laying down, and we were looking and assessing the wind damage. This was a, a couple years after the wind event, um, and pretty much everything green in that picture is amber honeysuckle, right? especially on the, the center and the left side. So it, it responded aggressively with all the disturbance and the light into the ecosystem. And so that's why we're talking about um, individual plant treatments to deal with woodies. These same treatments uh, can also work for native woody plants if we're targeting them for management. And a lot of times in forest management, we are targeting um, some native species. So I'm not going to talk about individual native species here, uh, but just know that the same techniques we discuss um, for woody invasive plants can work when you're managing native woodies as well. 
whether that's for thinning a forest um, to create better light situations, uh, removing some of the canopy to get enough light in there to regenerate seedlings or something like that. This, these same practices uh, can work for that. So let's get into these individual plant treatments. This is different than um, broadcast spraying or prescribed fire where you're treating many plants at the same time. This we're talking about is treating one plant at a time. You, you deal with one plant, move to the next plant and so forth and so on, right? And we can do this through mechanical means, uh, chemical means, or a combination of the two. And so we're going to go into detail on all of, all of these. So our options are, again, mechanical removal. So that would be with or without aids. And so we'll talk about both of those. Um, spot, spray, spot spray foliar application where you're treating the foliage of an individual plant or stem treatments. And we'll go into big detail with these stem treatments, um, cut stump, basal bark, and injection. So overall, your principles when you're looking at woody plant management, since these, uh, these plants tend to sprout very aggressively, your goal is to kill or remove um, the root system, somehow render it enable, uh, unable to, to sprout, right? So again, mowing or cutting alone is usually not sufficient when you're dealing with these woody plants. Oftentimes, follow-up treatment is necessary. You're going to miss a few individuals. There's going to be seedlings. Some are just not going to... Um, not going to die even with effective treatment. You're going to get sprouts then or reinfestations from adjacent lands. So in terms of mechanical treatments, what we're talking about is that physical removal or damage of the plant, right? Actually physically grabbing or removing the plant, damaging it, not using chemicals, not using herbicides. So there's a couple options for woody plants uh, in terms of individual plant treatments using mechanical means. One is simply hand pulling. And so this is a picture uh, from many years ago, actually now, uh, of a big group of volunteers hand pulling round leaf bittersweet out of a natural area. And just to show you how long ago, you can see that my beard has no white in it. I'm over there on the left. And then the little kids on the left of the picture, uh, that's my daughter and my son. My daughter is now married and my son is now 6'2". So uh, you can tell this picture has been around for a while. But um, we were hand pulling round leaf bittersweet. And so the nice thing about that is it doesn't require any specialized tools um, other than gloves. So the positives of hand pulling, if that's the option that you want to use, uh, it's very good for volunteers. There's very little training necessary. There's no licensing and there's no capacity issue in terms of a, designing a volunteer um, work day. As many people as, as can come, you can put, put them to work, right? It also works on a lot of species, uh, especially species that are very small in diameter. Um, it can also work on annuals and biennials, but for woody plants, running vines, young seedlings, small diameter stems, you can hand pull. The negatives to hand pulling is that it's there's very much a limited applicability for larger woody plants. Um, there's definitely a potential for ineffectiveness. So if you tend to break the stem off or break uh, roots off on some species, you may not actually be killing that plant. It may just be able to sprout right back. Um, if you're doing it at a time of the year where there's um, mature fruit on there or seeds on there, you could be spreading those seeds around. And it does tend to promote soil disturbance. So kind of understanding the positive and negatives of hand pulling, again, kind of limited applicability to those smaller situations when you're dealing with, with woody plants. Kind of stepping up uh, a, a level in mechanical would be the use of these mechanical pulling aids. So these are, are tools that give you additional leverage that lets you um, target larger plants that you you just simply couldn't do easily just with um, just with your hands, basically, right? And so these are again pulling aids, levers. They they all have really funny names like puller bear and extractigator and honeysuckle popper and all these weird uh, names, but they're all kind of share the common uh, feature that they tend to have some kind of jaw or claw or something to hold on to the plant close to the ground, and then a base um, like to serve as a fulcrum, and then a long um, lever to kind of give you that that advantage, that mechanical advantage to pull the plants out of the ground. 
You can also do some of these mechanical pullings yeah, with larger equipment, with chains and things and tractors and, and pulling things up like that. Some of the principles still apply. Uh, the positives of, of mechanical pulling aids, another one that's very good for volunteers, right? There's really very little training, no licensing. Uh, it works on many woody invases, so smaller diameter stems going up to maybe inch and a half, maybe two inches if you have a big one. Um, especially works well on shallow rooted species like the bush honeysuckles. Uh, and it works in many situations, particularly if you have loose, uncompacted soils and enough soil moisture so that you're pulling the roots out instead of breaking them, it tends to work. Uh, the negatives of using mechanical pulling aids are they tend to be very heavy, so it causes fatigue pretty fast, and they don't work on a lot of species. Larger diameter species, deep-rooted species like autumn olive tend not to be um, as effectively removed using this, this technique. And they don't work in some situations, particularly dry or compacted soils, and they also promote a lot of soil disturbance. So one more mechanical or non-chemical um, technique for individual plant treatment would be the use of girdling without herbicides. And so here's a picture of some native species being removed, but you can see that um, the girdles are on there. So the way that this works would be to cut one or two continuous rings around the entire circumference of the trunk of the plant you're targeting below any forks. So if there's a split in the trunk, you want to go below that. These cuts need to be deep enough to completely sever through the phloem and the cambial layers. And it's crucial that that girdle is continuous completely around the tree. So you're completely severing that phloem layer. Um, in general, growing season girdles um, tend to be more effective than do dormant season girdles and double girdling. So putting two girdles on, a, on the plant uh, separated by six to eight inches are, um, based on studies, tend to be slightly more effective than just a single girdle. A lot of times with girdling, you, you will get sprouts is the problem, right? So it doesn't always work. And there's a lot of tools. You could use chainsaws. I particularly like electric chainsaws for this. Um, you can use a hatchet to do a frill cut, it's called, or create a girdle that way. You can do a girdle chain or one of these other kind of tools that are specifically designed for girdling. Regardless of what you choose, you would want to have something that leaves a pretty big kerf. So the kerf is kind of the area that is cut and removed. If you use a... Um, like a, a reciprocating saw or a pruning saw or something with a really narrow blade, um, and you're just creating a really narrow girdle, a lot of times that is very easy for that plant to grow over and, and reconnect. So whatever you do, you would want it to be thick enough to make sure that you're completely severing um, severing that, that cambial and phloem layer for sure. Uh, so the positives to girdling without using herbicides is that it's quick. It doesn't require much equipment, um, you know, just again, uh, a hatchet or a, a chainsaw or something like that. And it can work on large woody plants, right? Medium to large woody plants. Small stems are usually too difficult to kind of effectively girdle, uh, but medium and large ones, it, it, it you can apply for that or it's applicable for that. And it can be effective without herbicide, though it takes time for mortality, right? So a lot of times... Um, you will get sprouts, or even if you don't get sprouts, it'll take sometimes up to a year for those plants to die. Uh, the negatives is it isn't always effective, right? It can be effective, but a lot of times um, with certain species, ones especially that are aggressive sprouters, it'll, it'll tend to sprout from below the girdle, or it can actually grow around and reconnect over the girdle. Um, thick bark species can be difficult to girdle with non-power tools. And it can be a very difficult to apply this on multiple stem species. So for plants that tend to branch close to the ground or have multiple stems coming from the ground, uh, think about honeysuckle or, or autumn olive. This can be a little bit less applicable. Here's just a shot of a couple of native plants that were girdled that um, were girdled ineffectively. And you can see they both grew over the girdle and reconnected um, uh, the, the, the plant be, uh, over top of the girdle, and so they just continue to, to live beyond that. So those are our, our kind of mechanical, non-chemical means. I'm going to jump into um, the use of herbicide applications in individual plant treatment. And so when you're using herbicides, it can be used as the sole 
treatment. So that's all you're doing is applying herbicide. That would be a foliar treatment or a basal bark application. Or you can use herbicides in conjunction with mechanical means. And so cut stumps or injection, we'll talk about all of those. And the advantage of herbicide applications is they're targeted and used to kill that root system of the plant to prevent it from sprouting. Now, anytime you're using herbicides or chemicals, you have to make sure that you read and follow the label. The label is the law, and it lays down when you can use that herbicide, how you can use it, um, and especially what kind of protective equipment you need um, when you are applying that herbicide to remain safe. In general, the protective gear involves some kind of eye protection, long, long sleeves, long pants, closed-toed shoes, and then some kind of chemical gloves. Um, but again, each herbicide will have a specific protective gear that you need to use for it lay on that label. So be sure to read and follow those labels. For woody plant control, there's a number of common herbicides that are used. And so I'll just mention a handful of those that we commonly use. Um, glyphosate, so that would be Roundup or many, many of the generics. A uh, super common one that's very um, often used to control woody invasive plants. It is a non-selective broad-spectrum herbicide, which means it basically works on any type of, of plant. It generally works on actively growing plants, um, especially if you're spraying the foliage, obviously. But again, it works on any any plant, so broadleaf, um, grasses, things like that. And there are aquatic labeled versions of it, which is nice. Triclopyr is probably the other really, really common herbicide that is that is used in these situations. Um, there's Garlon, Tahoe. It's an ingredient in Crossbow. There's a lot of generics out there. Triclopyr differs from, from glyphosate in that it's broadleaf specific. So it really has no, little to no impact on grasses or other monocots. It, it really focuses its impacts on the broadleaf plants, the dicots, um, for sure. And that gives you some selectivity when you're trying to treat some plants next to, um, you know, monocots mixed in. And there's actually three versions of, of triclopyr out there, and that does tend to confuse people. There's an amine, a new choline, and an ester. And basically, um, kind of generalizing it, the amine and the chol choline versions you mix with water. They're really good for foliar applications and cut stump, and they both have an aquatic label, so you can use these in and around um, you know, water systems. The ester ver version, you tend to mix with oil, and it's used for cut stump, but really that's the basal bark version that, that we use that for. That's kind of the, the real specific use that this is best for. And it can be used for some foliar applications, but it's, um, it's not used as well for that. And then you do tend to worry about volatilization when you're using that ester if you're trying to use this in, in hot conditions. So just to show you that there's a, there's a bunch of different things going on with triclopyr. Uh, there's amino pyrrolid, which is milestone, which is another one of those broadly specific ones, but it has specific activity uh, more so on a few groups of plants, so beans and asters and a few other families, and it does have some level of soil residual to it. And, and for woody plant control, we often use it either as a foliar spray or we add it to triclopyr to give us a little bit more control for hard to control species when we're doing cut stumps or, or basal barks. Uh, there's a relatively new one out there called aminocyclopyrichlor. It's method 240. This one's fairly similar um, to, to milestone in the sense that it's broadly specific. It gives you that selectivity. It also has soil residual and it can be used a little bit as a pre-emergent. This one you have to be a little careful with because it can move a little bit in the soil and can give you some impacts to non-target trees when you apply it near them. But it's good to know that that's an option. Two more, there's picloram, which is toured on, very, very effective on woody plants, but it does tend to move easily in water and soil and through root grafts. So you would be careful using this around um, trees that you want to not damage. And the same thing can be said for a mazapir. That's Arsenal Stalker and a few others. This one's general broad spectrum, so kind of like glyphosate, it works on all plants. It does have an aquatic label. Uh, but it has a soil residual as well, and it can move through soil and, and root grafts. So this is one that we, we use for really hard to control species like Tree of Heaven. And then just to show you that uh, if you read the label, it talks about some of this, right? So for the Pickleram, the one on the top, it says right there, 
um, don't apply near ornamental trees and shrubs because they may take they might take it up um, and then take the herbicide up through their roots and then impact them right and so and the same thing for the the stalker or mazapir. Anyway, there's a bunch of ones out there. I just wanted to kind of highlight to get you familiar with some of the different herbicides that are used when you're doing individual plant treatments. But we'll just get into the different ones and we're going to start with spot spray foliar treatments. So that's when you're applying um, herbicide to the foliage of the plant, directly to the foliage of the plant. And it's typically a very dilute formulation of herbicide, often diluted down to one, two percent or something like that of herbicide with water. Uh, it's important when you're using spot spray treatments to get thorough coverage of, of the leaves. Um, so you want to get it kind of cover the leaves thoroughly with a fine mist or a fine um, series of of herbicide dots, but you don't want to spray it so heavily that the the herbicide's pooling on there and actually dripping, dripping off or running off of the leaves because you're putting too much herbicide. When you're using spot spray treatments, foliage should be green and actively growing. You want a healthy tree so it can take up that herbicide and then um, and then work its way down into the roots and kill that plant. The, you want to watch for non-target impact. Since you're spraying the foliage in the air, it can easily pass through that plant and hit anything that's that's close by. And then just, again, just to, just to highlight, you need to have an actively growing, healthy green plant. This is uh, an amber honeysuckle. You can see here that it's already starting to yellow uh, in the fall. And it's kind of past the, the prime for using uh, a foliar spot spray on it right now. It will not take up that herbicide through the leaves because the leaves are already well into the process of shutting down. So you would not use foliar spray when the plants look like this. Uh, in terms of the positives of using spot spray foliar, it's fairly inexpensive. Um, it's easy to apply. The really only tool that you need would be a backpack sprayer or one of those little hand pump sprayers. Um, it works on small to medium size plants. You do not want to spray um, the foliage of anything that's over about six feet tall, simply just because you're putting so much herbicide into the air, you didn't want it to come back on you or you're uh, increasing your chances for non-targets. So you'd want to limit this to small or, or medium sized woody invasive plants. Um, it doesn't require cutting blades or power tools, so your safety is a little higher there. It does not disturb the soil, and you don't have to deal with the slash. And when I talk about slash, I'm just meaning uh, the plants that you cut down and you have to move them or drag them somewhere. You don't have to deal with that when you're just spraying the foliage. You let them stand and, and die in place, basically. Uh, the negatives of using spot spray is it's really only applicable in the growing season. You have to have that um, that actively growing vegetation. There are a few kind of semi-evergreen drifting towards evergreen plants like Japanese honeysuckle that you can use this method uh, in the winter on warm days, but that's, there's just a few of those. Um, another negative would be the chances for overspray and non-target impacts are higher uh, than other techniques we're going to talk about here. And you're, since it's a dilute formulation, you're carrying a lot of mix, right? It takes a lot of water. You have to put it on your back. And so then it can, you can kind of get a little extra fatigue that way by carrying around a lot of mix when you're, you're using this method. So let's talk about stem treatments next. And so this, instead of spraying the foliage, you're applying the herbicide to the stem of the plant. Um, and so everything else we're going to talk about kind of falls into this broad category. Um, the advantage of stem treatments, again, is you're, you're um, applying it really directly to that stem. It uses a more concentrated formulation. So when I mentioned spot spray, we were talking one, two, three percent. A lot of times with um, stem treatments, you're going anywhere from 20 to 100 percent. Um, formulations of herbicide, you either not diluting it or diluting it, um, you know, one part to four part um, water or oil. So it's it's much more of a concentrated formulation, but you're applying a very much more small amount of it per plant, right? Because it's because it's so concentrated. So what can you expect with stem treatments? Uh, you can expect you should expect eighty plus percent mortality after two years. So eight out of every 10 plants that you treat using a stem treatment method uh, should be dead after two years. And sometimes it's a little slow to act. We just finished up a study not long ago 
where after year one, we only had 66% mortality and we followed it up the next year and that, that treatment moved up to 83% mortality. So sometimes it really does take a couple years to, to uh, completely kill these plants using stem treatments. But you should expect if you're using the right herbicide, the right timing, the right technique, you should expect at least eight out of every 10 plants to die, if not closer to 10 out of every 10. We'll get into all these treatments here in a second, but just kind of lumping them as a group. Uh, the pros uh, of stem treatments are that um, it's less herbicide mix to carry because it's a more concentrated version. You're usually just using, um, you know, small bottles and things like that. So it's a little easier to, to haul around. Uh, the directed application where you're applying it right to the stem really reduces the chance for overspray, right? So you don't have that overspray like you do with foliar, so it, you can reduce the non-target impacts. These tend to be very effective. Again, 90% um, should be your expectation. And you have nearly a year-round application window. Um, with a couple of exceptions that we'll talk about, there's almost a, not a time of the year that you can't use this treatment to control woody invasive plants. And you can treat tall plants when you when foliar spray is not an option. So there really is no size limit when using stem treatments, which is nice. Uh, some of the negatives of it would be that the concentrated herbicide makes um, a little bit more risky if you do have a spill or you get exposure as the applicator because you're getting exposed to a higher concentrated um, version of the herbicide versus a more dilute as compared to foliar. So there's a little bit more risk with that. Um, if you treat very, very dense stands of woody plants, there's a chance that you're going to um, apply more herbicide per, per acre than, um, than is really allowed. So you had to be careful when really, really dense stands so you don't want to over apply. And then again, as we talked about earlier, some herbicides move through root grafts, so you may increase uh, your chance of, of non-target impacts if you use things like picloram or amazapir that we talked about when you're close to um, desirable woody plants. So that, that's, some, that's a risk there as well. So you just have to be careful on which herbicide you use uh, and where. But just getting into these application options for stem treatments, uh, one of the, the most common ones and ones I'm sure that most of us most of us are familiar with would be a simple cut stump treatment. So cut stump treatments um, is kind of exactly what it sounds like, right? You cut the plant down and you treat that cut stump, that cut surface of the stump with a concentrated uh, systemic herbicide to prevent sprouting. The nice thing about cut stump treatments is that you can do that again on any woody plant kind of regardless of size. So here we are just cutting a, a big bush honeysuckle down, and then you can see on the left uh, an autumn olive um, stump that's been treated uh, with herbicide. You can see here also on larger stumps, you really only have to treat that outer one inch or so. So you don't have to treat the whole stump surface, just that cambial and phloem layer along the outer edge. Tools that you would use for cut stump, chainsaws, hand saws, clearing saws, loppers, brush axes, uh, reciprocating saws with pruning blades, a lot of different options. It kind of depends on um, the size of the plants. If you're looking, if you're doing cut stump on larger plants, you would obviously probably go with a, a chainsaw, but a lot of these other tools can be very effective, especially for the smaller individuals. And then you'd want some ability to put the herbicide. So pressurized spray, spray bottles, a hand, like a 409 kind of style hand pump spray bottle, even a paintbrush, a foam paintbrush, or one of those uh, daubers like a, a shoe polish dauber. You know, there's a lot of different um, options out there for applying the herbicide to it. But in general, uh, water-based solutions uh, for cut stump are more effective than oil-based solutions uh, because they're more readily taken up into the, the system of the plants, especially during the summer and the fall. And then even in winter, if the temperatures are above freezing, if it's below freezing, then you would want to switch to an oil-based solution in the winter months. And again, treat the entire surface of small stems and the outer inch or inch and a half of larger stems. And I really like adding an herbicide dye because it's helpful in tracking which ones I've treated and which ones I missed. Kind of the old uh, general thought was 
treatments are most effective mid to late fall. Um, actually, a lot of the research coming out now shows that that's not necessarily the case, that it's pretty highly effective um, almost any time of the year with the exception of that green up period in early spring. So after the buds start swelling all the way until the leaves have fully expanded. So that's a, a narrow window, sometimes four, five, six weeks. Um, that's the period that you would not want to treat. But um, a lot of uh, directly following that um, in late, late spring or early summer and is often very, very effective. And then kind of throughout the rest of the year as well, this can be very effective. The big thing that you have to do with cut stump is apply the herbicide uh, almost right away or almost immediately after cutting it down. The longer you wait between cutting that plant down and treating those stumps, the less effective it's going to be because that plant's starting to shut down that transfer transport system and it's just not going to move that herbicide into the roots as effectively if you wait too long. If you're in a situation where you have to wait because maybe some people are cutting and then you get uh, applicators in later to treat, um, if it's longer than that, about 15 minutes, then you would want to switch to an oil-based herbicide. And you would not only treat the top of that stump, but you'd actually let that herbicide run down onto the bark on the sides of the stump. That's what you would want to do if you have to wait longer than that 15 minutes. A couple of considerations when using cut stump. Uh, don't cut too close to the ground. Right, You don't want to flush cut it with the ground because dirt that gets onto that cut surface Um will limit the herbicide uptake, plus it's going to dull your tools if you get a lot of dirt on your saws and things. So I tend to leave um, that stump at like two to four inches high. It's high enough to be to remain clean, so it'll, it'll take up that herbicide, but it's not so high that it's going to be a tripping hazard. And then when you're doing a lot of this, you really want to develop a plan to handle that slash. You're cutting these plants down, you're felling them, so um, they're going to stack up and it's going to be difficult to kind of work through them. So sometimes you have small teams of, you know, three, four people where one person's cutting, a couple people are swamping or moving that, that, those slash, and then a couple people are applying. It seems to work really well. If you're by yourself, you just want to go slow and don't cut too many of them. Um, before applying the herbicide, because otherwise you're going to start missing things. Um, another stem treatment, and this one uh, is is often preferred because it, it doesn't require cutting stuff down, right? So this is one that's really common. It just uses herbicide. It's called basil bark. And so with this one, you're applying the herbicide directly to the stem of a woody plant. You're not cutting the plant down at all. You're just putting the herbicide right on the stem. Um, anywhere from ground level up to 12 to 14 inches high uh, around the entire circumference of the stem. Um, and you're letting that herbicide penetrate through that bark and get into the system of the plant that way. To do this, you would need a, uh, an herbicide that's designed for basal bark. And that's a lot of those ester formulation herbicides mixed with oil so it can hold onto the bark really well. Um, this uses more herbicide than cut stump. All right, you're putting a lot more herbicide on it. But again, it doesn't require cutting those plants down. So that's the advantage of it is that it's quick. You don't have to deal with the slash. You're letting the plants um, die standing, if you will. The tools for this would be, since you're using a little more herbicide, one of either one of these backpack sprayers or a larger volume kind of hand pressurized sprayer. And I really like long wands with this. Um, so you can really get in there and put the herbicide directly to um, that bark on the, the lower trunk. So ester formulations in oil with dye, like, like triclopyr, ester, something like that. Um, you can work on smaller stems. Um, so you'd want to have thin, relatively smooth bark. Uh, as plants get bigger, the bark tends to get corkier and thicker, and it will reduce uptake a little bit. Um, again, it leaves the plant standing. Uh, for smaller stems, I generally go, like for autumn olive, for example, I'll use it up to six or seven inches in diameter for autumn olive and above that I'll tend to switch to something different. Um, again, it leaves the plant standing, no slash, um, dealing with slash issues. Um, if you do have silt, so you're in an area that floods frequently or you're, uh, there's snow cover on the ground, both of those can re reduce the effectiveness of basil bark. And then a lot of times these plants will take a year to die, right? So a lot of times they'll leaf out in the spring, especially if you do a, a dormant season application. And then over the course of that growing season, it'll wilt and die. So you got to expect this to take a little bit longer um, than foliar spray to actually kill the plants.
when you're doing basal bark, you want to use low pressure, right? So you don't want to really pump up your, your sprayers because you're not splashing or streaming that herbicide on there. You're basically dribbling that herbicide. You're holding that wand right against the bark and just letting it slowly dribble out. That's going to be the best because you're not um, over applying the herbicide or splashing it and, and treat and hitting non-targets, right? So the lower, the lower pressure you can use when doing basal bark, the better. And then I tend to start at the top of the application zone, so 12 to 14 inches, and then just let it dribble down the bark and kind of complete the, the treatment that way. Again, you don't have any cutting or mechanical damage to the plants. And this is very nice for clonal species, so species that are connected underground, because it doesn't stimulate um, suckering at all with those. And so that's really nice. Um, it's pretty quick. There's not a lot of, of equipment outside of your applicator um, involved. And then the nice thing also about um, basil bark is you can do this any time of the year. There's really not that limitation during early spring like there is with cut stump. Um, you can pretty much use basil bark year round um, to treat invasive plants. But again, it does use more herbicide than the other stem treatments. Um, and then there's stem injections. And so this is one that's probably less people are familiar with. Um, this is kind of a hybrid between basil bark and, and cut stump where you're leaving the plant standing. You're not cutting it down, but you're not just treating the bark. You're actually making a small wound, a small damage site into on the stem of the plant and applying the herbicide directly into that damage site. So that way you're, you're, um, you're leaving the plant standing, but you're actually applying the herbicide through the bark. So you don't have to worry about penetrating through the bark as, because you're having this wound site. And there's a couple different options. There's the girdle option that we talked about other, uh, earlier, but you're applying herbicide to those girdles. Uh, there's hack and squirt and, and drill and fill as well. well. The funny names I know, but we'll talk about them in a minute. But all of these different stem injections, you know, you can use uh, a lot of different tools, things like brush axes, hatchets, machetes, chainsaws, girdle chains. Uh, cordless drill is awesome for drill and fill. And then some kind of small hand pump spray applicator works really well. So we'll just kind of get into the different stem injections. So girdle uh, or frill cuts, like we talked about earlier, you're cutting completely around the stem deep enough to expose the inner bark and the sapwood. You're cutting through that phloem and through that cambial layer. And in this case, you would directly spray the herbicide into that cut all the way around um, the plant. Girdle cuts ideally should be within a couple feet of the ground uh, and then an inch deep or at least deep enough to get through the bark for sure. Uh, and this works really well on larger stems. So we just did a lot of polonia or princess tree treatment here over the winter. Um, and so we tried different techniques. So we tried, uh, we'll tried um, hack and squirt and then also girdle and a few other things. And the girdle particularly was um, highly effective on it. And you can see here, this is one of those, those polonias. Um, every single one that we treated using the, the girdle method uh, with, with herbicide uh, is now dead. So it worked really great on them. So hack and squirt is where you, instead of girdling a complete ring around the plant, instead you're doing a series of downward chops with a hatchet or an ax or something to cut through the bark and expose that inner bark or expose that cambial layer. And then you're applying the herbicide directly into that, that hack, that chop that you just made. Sometimes I like to leave the hatchet in the cut and kind of bend it down so that it opens up the cut a little more. So it'll, it'll, um, you can e more easily apply the herbicide in there. Um, and then you want to put, depending on the size of the, the plant, you have to do multiple um, acts around it. And so we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But it's pretty quick. Again, it just uses a hatchet and a little spray bottle, something like that. You can see us doing the polonia here. One thing that we've been moving to a little bit because it's so easy is instead of doing a hatchet and a hack and squirt, uh, we switched to a drill, so a cordless drill with a three-eighths to a half-inch drill bit. We drill at a downward angle, one and a half to two inches deep into the wood, and then I put approximately one milliliter of herbicide in each hole. Um, and the number of holes depends on the size of the diameter, and we'll get into that in a second. But it um, is very, very effective. And actually, when we, we tested this against hack and squirt, we found this actually had higher mortality of the plants we were treating using this method. So... 
Uh, it's so easy and quick that we're moving um, away from hack and squirt and towards this drill and fill for a lot of um, a lot of treatments now. Uh, so with with drill and fill or or stem injections, any of these, um, you know, they're very simple, they're very portable, which is nice, right? It takes small amounts of um, herbicide and uh, and other tools. Uh, it gives you very little chance of non-target impacts, which is pretty nice. And it leaves the plant standing, so there's no slash issue. Um, some of the negatives will be you need to pay attention to your hand sprayers because they vary greatly in output. Some of them with one pump may only give half a milliliter, and others may give up to three milliliters. So kind of pay attention to your hand pump sprayers so that you're applying the, the, the right amount. The other thing is that with stem, you know, with really shrubby plants that branch close to the ground or have multiple stems, sometimes it's a little more difficult to do these um, stem injection kind of style of treatments just because it's hard to access them. Again, your application rate is very dependent on the number of stems. We'll get that in a, in a minute, but you want to read and follow the label. And then also sap flow uh, is very can drastically limit the efficacy of these in the winter, especially if you're treating things that tend to move. Uh, sap moves easily, like Norway maple or even some of our native maples. Um, so warm days in the winter can really impact this. And we found this out with a study we did on maples where we treated it a year when we had warm temperatures and the sap was flowing in winter. And after two years, uh, the mortality was only 18%. And then we did the same exact uh, treatments um, in a year when there in a time when the sap was not flowing. So it was it was not that kind of warm days in the winter. It was actually later in the fall uh, before the sap had an opportunity to start flowing, and our and our success rate was eighty three plus percent mortality. So very very different when the only thing that really differed there was uh, the timing and the sap flow. So be be mindful of that when you're doing stem treatments and. You can see here in the picture, it's a maple that had um, was was treated using hack and squirt, and you can see the the wound site died, but the tree is growing around that wound site and was not killed. So if you if you look at the labels and read them, here are some of the rates when you're looking at stem injections. So for glyphosate, um, we found one that said uh, fifty to one hundred percent concentration treated in a continuous frill around the entire. Um, plant or evenly spaced injection. So that could be a hack and squirt or a drill and fill. So it'd be one hack or, or drill for each two inches of diameter of the plant. Traclopyr amine was a um, half milliliter of undiluted um, herbicide for every three to four inches along the surface, the circumference. Amazapyr was a full girdle. Um, and then aminocyclopyr was a half to one milliliter in um, one injection for each two inches. So they all differ a little bit, read the herbicide you have, um, but pretty fast for species that you can easily access the trunk, I would say. All righty, the last few things I'll mention here before we open it up for questions uh, and get into resources. One, if you're, you're treating sprouts, so if you either miss a plant or you've cut it down and you're gonna let it grow back and treat the sprouts the next year, um, you can do that and treat the uh, sprouts using a foliar spot spray application, but you would want to let those sprouts get up to 20, 18 to 24 inches tall simply because they have enough leaf area then to take the herbicide up and, and kill those plants. Don't treat them when they're just showing up like in this picture because you're not going to be able to get enough herbicide in there to, to kill those roots. So something with sprouts. Clonal species like black locust, tree of heaven, or round leaf bittersweet can be extremely difficult to control um, simply because they're all connected underground. Um, they're all one individual. It's often a big um, clonal mass of them. And so um, it's just difficult to control that because of the interconnectivity in the roots, as well as any kind of damage. Tissue damage above ground tends to stimulate those to regressively root sucker. So I would avoid cut stomp or mowing treatments or anything that does heavy damage to the above ground portion of any of these clonal species, but instead consider basal bark, foliar spray, or, or drill and frill, or some of these stem injections, um, because you're doing less mechanical damage and you're going to keep those plants from 
I'm being stimulated to root sucker as much. And we've done this with great effect. Here's a study we did a few years ago where we did round leaf bittersweet um, with basal bark treatments, and it was highly effective at controlling them in this situation. So those are all the different kind of options for you um, for um, kind of different individual plant treatments. So just kind of getting into some of the resources if you want to learn more about this. Um, of course, our extension forestry page has a, has a, a, our management guide there. It has a lot of other information about uh, invasive plants. We have our YouTube channel um, that has a lot of videos on um, kind of demonstrating these te demonstrating these techniques um, in the videos and other things. So it's a great way just to um, kind of learn more about these or see them in action. Uh, Extension has a new invasives page. So it's extension.illinois.edu slash invasives, where it has a lot of information about not only invasive plants, but invasive insects, invasive animals. Really, really great page um, that goes into detail. So I'd recommend you checking that out. Particularly for woody invasives, there is um, a really great resource called the Woody Invasives of the Great Lakes Collaborative. So it's woodyinvasives.org, and they go into a lot of detail in this page, not only about how to identify plants, what are great alternatives to plant instead of these invasives, but a lot about control techniques, um, recommendations, a lot of things. So that is a really great resource for anybody that really wants to learn a lot about controlling woody invasive plants in this region. Uh, the Midwest Invasive Plant um, network has a control database as well that you can go into and, and get a lot of information. And then kind of finally for resources, what I think is one of the best resources out there is um, one of my colleagues, Stephen Enlow, who's a professor down at the University of Florida and probably one of the leading experts in, in the world on these stem injection treatments and, and individual plant treatments put together very, very detailed video series on basil bark, cut stump, and hack and squirt. And they're all available if you scroll down to the bottom of the list on that, uh, on the page that I linked to there, um, and really goes into super detail. So if, if you're ever interested in a deep dive on these topics, I'd highly recommend um, going through these video series for sure. And so with that, just a real quick summary, uh, we talked about individual plant treatments, and they are definitely a great option for controlling woody invasive plants. Uh, there's lots of treatment options available out there that are mechanical, chemical, or the integration of both of those techniques. Um, you could use a lot of these resources that, that I mentioned now or, or other things on our website to, to get exact recommendations including kind of water besides to use and what rates for sure. Uh, I just really, my focus today was to kind of go over the different options and when to use them and when not to use them and things like that.